You have to make sure you expose your family to the gospel, that they see you put God first. They see you pay your tithes. They know that you serve God. They know that you won't switch. They have, you have to model it at house. It's not what you say at home. It's what you do at home that creates the environment. I'm a builder by nature. I like to build businesses. I like to remodel buildings. I like to go to the cornerstone of what I want to repair and begin to work out from there because I, I maybe hate backing up. I do not want to back up ever. I don't like to lose ground. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ground taker, but I'm also a ground holder. The Bible says strong men retain riches and strong women retain honor. There's power in retention. Now, I'm not telling you that you might have not have a minus every now and then, but strength in God is wonderful. You don't have to give anything back to the devil when God gave it to you, if you, you know what I mean? That's why sometimes I, I, I pour water on the altar of what I want to get it all wet so the fire can consume it, and I know it's God. See, I got to know. I got to know. I don't want to think. I got to know. There's a huge difference in knowing and thinking. You'll quit on thinking, but you won't quit on knowing. Your knower will, will strengthen you in time of great adversity. When nothing's going your way, your knower will take you out the other side. Hallelujah. For, mercy, forbearance, compassion. Hallelujah. To a, showing leniency to a person holy in one's charge. In other words, when somebody can put you in jail or do anything they want to you and they show you mercy and they forgive you, that's mercy. When they have the right to do anything they want to do to you, but they can't do it because their character says, I want to show mercy. That's a character trait of God. It comes from God's nature. When it works through humanity, it, it really, mercy is considering the condition of other people's sorrow and pain and getting involved in helping them when it comes through humanity. Which, in, this is a personal experience, but I believe you have to pray before you help people. I, know, I realize that if they have food and regular things. I don't think you've got to go pray about that. Jesus fed the hungry, clothed the naked, took care of the fatherless and the widows. But before you start getting involved in being God and repairing their life, you have to ask God about that. Because see, they might be going through something they need to know to, to break and be, to listen to God. You can't interfere with the work of God. You couldn't save Israel when it was under Egypt's bondage. God had to. You're not the Savior. You can't save everybody from their problems. As hard as it might seem, you have to let people struggle because in the struggle is where they learn and they change. Anyway, so God, throughout the Old Testament, mercy was, was how he saw things. Exodus 22, 21 through 23. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the lands of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or any fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, at all. That means if they whimper to God, God's going to hear them. 
I will surely hear their cry. God obviously is merciful and he hears and he's kind. And uh, he expects the same character from us. I don't, I, the, you know, it's funny, the Bible sounds like a contradictory book. I mean, it says if you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> so that doesn't sound like mercy, but Jesus fed the poor. He said, the poor you will always have with you. There will always be an element of poverty. And I do believe you're supposed to help the afflicted, but I don't think you're supposed to do what they won't do. I mean, that, God said you don't work, you don't eat, so obviously you're not supposed to feed somebody while they stay home and don't work. I mean, it goes against the Bible. Anyway, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Psalm 82, 3. It's funny how God gets in you and he runs out your eyes and stuff, doesn't he? Defend the poor and the fatherless and do justice to the afflicted and needy. God, this is an expectation of the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, it was an expected attitude of, of God toward other people, right? This expectation passed on to the church in the New Testament, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they, for they shall receive mercy. Boy, I tell you, you talk about sowing and reaping. I've needed this scripture. You ever need this scripture? You ever need this scripture? I've needed this scripture. Under pressure, all that ugliness comes out of you, all them words and all that anger and all that stuff. It's all stored away in your heart somewhere, but it not, it's like a pressure cooker. Until there's pressure on it, it won't come out. Sometimes God's got to allow affliction so you can see what's in you. I mean, he literally, I'm not telling you God trying to kill you. <laughs> if he wanted to, you'd be dead. So you wouldn't have survived it. But he'll allow affliction for your character to change. And when that affliction's going on, that's when you think, well, I want to quit and I want to leave this situation. All that does is reveal to you the level of your strength. If you want to quit when things get hard, you're not very strong yet. So he's going to have to allow that to kind of hang around till it pushes you up to the next level of commitment. You hear, you hear where I'm going. He, your life will be a series of commitment growth to where you could say, I'll never leave him in your heart. That you don't ever want to leave him. You'd rather die than leave him. You'd rather die than not do what he says. Anyway, blessed are the merciful. John 3, 16, through, 1 John, I'm sorry, 16 through 17. Hereby we perceive. Perceive would be to understand, right? We, the love of God. This is God's modem of operation. This is God's character. Because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We'll just pause there for a minute. Leave that up there, though. You realize that Jesus says, this is the motto. I laid down my life for you. And my expectation is that you will lay down your life for others. Sacrificial life. Our life, Christians, is, is, is their life is to be a sacrificial life. I'm not sure how much in America they're sacrificed because there's been so much abundance now you can't tell anymore who you can really rely on in a pinch. It's been covered over with, the, with prosperity and actually, if you're going to split the hairs, it's been covered over with a false prosperity because we've borrowed trillions of dollars to bless each other. So I'm not so sure we know who we are anymore. We've lost our roots, our identity, and we've allowed it to be stolen because we like comfort more than we like the truth. Because if you follow the truth, you won't always have everything you want. It, will, it won't always be there. It'll take you places that you wouldn't normally go. You know, Paul, when you look at Paul's life or Moses' life or Peter's life, one of the things Jesus said to Peter is, when you get old, you're not going to get to do what you want to do, Peter. Another man's going to lead you. That's a tough saying. That don't sound very prosperity, does it? doesn't sound like a, well, that's not faith, brother. Well, it's in the Bible. I don't know what to tell you. It's, he said, you're going to go places you don't want to go at the end of your days, Peter. You're going to be led where you don't want to go. You know, I, I always quote this. I think it's in Josephus' writings. You've heard me say it, those of you who've attended here for years. I've used the same model because it's such a great model. 
Peter wanted to quit, and he didn't want to do it anymore. You know, you think, how could an apostle, great apostle, do that? Well, you know, Paul said he despaired of life. Does that sound suicidal to you? I'm not trying to bring Paul down. I think he was great. But don't you think he had to face the same afflictions? When a man despairs of life, he's saying, I want to die. Now, that shows you how great the conflict can get. And they, in this, Josephus, Josephus put in this writing that Peter was walking out of town. He was done. He wanted to quit doing the job. And guess who met him? Jesus. Jesus met him when he wanted to quit. And he said, Peter, where are you going? He says, I'm going that way. And Jesus said, because he was walking this way, he said, but I'm going that way. And Peter turned around and was crucified upside down in that same city. He said, I'm going that way. How many times do we want to quit and avoid what God wants us to go through to become what we are supposed to become? I'm not preaching doom and gloom. I, I was, this week I was thinking about the gospel because it's, it's, we have such an imbalanced church in the West of, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, when they cut your arms off over there in the Middle East and, and cut the boobs off women because they couldn't feed their babies, all these cruel things that the devil has to think up because it wouldn't be normal. If you ask them, they, they'd think the end of the world was coming right then, you know? Jesus was coming back because of tribulation. They're going through tribulation. But here we get disconnected because of the, of the blessing. And we talk about the blessing a lot, but I was talking to God this week or praying. And, you know, I'm driving. I get a lot while I'm driving. And what I got out of it was, if you have a car and you only connect a positive pole, it won't do anything. If you only connect a negative pole, it won't do anything. So if all you ever preach is hellfire and brimstone, you're going to scare people into heaven, but they're not going to stick. If all you ever preach is the blessing, when they're not getting blessed, they won't stick. But if you can preach the positive and negative pole, the balanced gospel, you're going to make strong believers that don't quit when it's not going their way. I believe, you know that, I don't believe in being broke. I mean, I've been preaching prosperity for years, but I don't believe there's, quote, a prosperity gospel. I believe the gospel has got everything in it. And I, and I know there's prosperity inside that gospel, but for me to label it as a prosperity gospel, to me, would be a wrong label to put on God's Word. Because when you got God, you got everything anyway. Do I believe that God wants you to prosper? Absolutely. But to label it as that's the gospel, I can't do it. Because, see, there's a cross in that same gospel. There's a death to self in that same gospel, a sacrificial death. There's... There's loving, unlovable people. I mean, it is such a big book. How can you narrow it down to one title? Anyway, so, uh, but whosoever has this world's goods and shall see his brother have a need and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? God is telling you that if you see needs, a real need, okay, I personally think this, this requires a lot of prayer, and I really do, because every time you, you meet the needs of the people in the, when God is trying to teach them something, and I'm not saying he's trying to make them poor, but he's trying to make them pray, you postpone that, that relational thing. Most of my growth as a, as a Christian and my relationship with God grew in affliction. And I have done my best not to tell anybody about my affliction and have my wars private. I don't know how you feel about that, but see, if I whine, somebody might fix it for me and I'll have to take the class again. I don't want to whine and have somebody have me who's got a gift of compassion fix my life and me have to run the same class. I think that if you can dig into God, That'll do it. Now, I'm not telling you that people shouldn't help each other. I'm just telling you, I think you've got to pray before you go around fixing everything for everybody. And you guys know this, that you have seen this generation. 
All the parents have fixed their kids. The kids are moved back in. I think you've got to let them struggle and, we'll, and let it go, baby. You've got to let them struggle. You don't need them at 35 back in your house with two kids and a wife. I'm sorry. You just don't. They ain't supposed to be there. For this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. They got their own life. They have their own stuff. And their struggle, you know, uh, I think that if you, like the World War II people, they were just glad to be home and have, have stuff. And they bought their kids as much as they could because they didn't have anything. And it, it almost produced a, a group that can, it's iffy on taking care of themselves. The system is designed 100% for you to be dependent on it. That's why it is so hard for people to get ahead because the government, I hate to say the government or the system, it's meant to hem them in in knowledge. It's meant to hem them in, in their level of wealth because it's the best way to control people. And I'm going to touch a racial topic, but you know that's the best way to keep people poor is to keep them unlearned. And you know, you know they, they didn't teach the black people anything for a long time. They didn't want them to know anything because they wanted to use them for their means. And I will tell you that same motive is in operation today. And some of it's racial and some of it is purely just a, a system that wants to control people. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I believe that in no matter what system it is, God is greater than that system, and I believe with my whole heart in the name of Jesus that you can prosper in spite of what system you're in because God is greater than this system. And I know that is a truth. That God can prosper you, but you will have to do it God's way, which means you will have to begin to see how do you wean yourself off of the system if you don't have another method yet? When I say method, method in the kingdom is trust. When you trust God, you can start to let go of what makes you feel secure and take you into what is your destiny. They have, I've said this before, they have stolen all the visionary entrepreneurship by security. And yet with every piece of security you get, you get control. I don't know about you, I believe in being a free moral agent and deciding what you're going to do with your life. And I do believe in the pursuit of happiness. And I, I believe it is available. I think it's very watered down and convoluted or however you want to look at it. And you have to fight for it. So you have to fight for what I'm talking about. Jesus said, fight the fight, pretty much. Paul, you know, he said, Paul said, endure hardness as a good soldier. He, Ephesians 6 is about a fight. The armor, the gospel, the helmet of salvation. You know, why do you need armor if there's no fight? So you have to fight to live in the kingdom. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, he said. Our goal, I think, is to be stronger than the devil's system of control. I mean, Jesus did it. They didn't take his life, he gave it. They did not take his life. He said, I lay it down, and I have the power to take it up. They did not take Jesus' life. He stood silent before them and never said a word, because if he'd have talked, they wouldn't have been able to kill him. In other words, he said, if I talk too much, my dad's going to show up with the angels, and this isn't going to work for you. I'm going to be quiet and let you kill me, because that's for what I came into the world to be as a sacrificial lamb. But if I talk, it won't happen. I'll mess it up. Did you ever hear that in that Braveheart, they said, you can take our lives, but you can't take our freedom. You almost have to get to the place where you'd rather live one day free than a hundred in captivity. Which means you have to put everything on the line for that particular battle. That's why it's so important that you know God and your children know God. Because whatever a man decides to do with his family, they got to go through it too. You, you, you with me? If nothing's harder to live as a Christian life when one person wants to sacrifice and the other one don't, it's like you're persecuted in your own house for wanting to do the will of God. It happens. It happens a lot. 
It's if you guys that are married, if you can walk in step with your mate, uh, don't run too far ahead. Try to take everybody with you. Jesus said, I've not lost one that you've given me. Jesus took everybody, and he only lost the one who was assigned to betray him. Other than that, he didn't lose anybody. You have to make sure you expose your family to the gospel, that they see you put God first. They see you pay your tithes. They know that you serve God. They know that you won't switch. They have, you have to model it at house. It's not what you say at home. It's what you do at home that creates the environment. It's not what you say. I mean, listen, I've talked to my kids a lot. It was never what I said. It was what I did. That's easy to figure out when you get old, you know. <laughs> they do what you did, not what you said. They model it. Mercy from God is the foundation of forgiveness. I personally think it's not an emotion. It's a character trait. I think the feelings of compassion will make you want to do things. But how, just bear with me here, man. How many times have you got all teary-eyed and helped somebody and found out that was the dumbest thing you ever did? Okay? So obviously, it can't be an emotional thing because, because you had emotions and compassion, you did something for them that might not have been what needed done at that time. So there is a place above it that it's a character trait of God's character that you're merciful to people because you're a merciful person. It's inside of you. It's not an emotion. The people in the wilderness, you know, God fed those Israelites in the wilderness while they complained. That's mercy. It was in his power to wipe them right out. And instead, he showed them mercy. One of the ways, see, this is how important prayer is, people. Do you know why he showed them mercy? The prayers of Moses. That's why Moses prayed and God showed them mercy. Maybe you might not know this, but some of you have had people pray for you and it's the only reason you're still around. You know, I was going to put this on Facebook. I, I might anyway. I said, God is always trying to save people. This is what I thought yesterday. But they're trying to commit suicide by disobedience. <laughs> It's real hard to save somebody who wants to kill himself. I mean, God did everything he could do to save people, and they run around and try to commit suicide by doing ungodly things and opening the door for the devil. That's why you can't ever say that God sent anybody to hell because he, he did everything he could so you wouldn't go. If you go, it's by your own choice. You can't blame God for any of those things. Mercy cannot be attained through works. It's a gift. If it was attained, it wouldn't be mercy. Mercy is when you don't deserve it, and you get it anyway. It, you know, if, if you have an earnings mentality or a legalistic faith, you, you, you know, we all have some legalism in, in us because it's called religion. Religion is extremely legal, and it keeps score, and it, it knows what everybody else ought to be doing, and anytime you see any of those things in you, you just know that that's religion, and God's going to try to purge it out. Uh, it's almost like saying that you did what you did for God and he owes you and he should be nice to you. See, that's not mercy. That's debt. And God doesn't owe anybody anything. If anything, we owe God. Because he paid our debt, but he doesn't throw it up in our face. How do you like that? Did God ever receive, I saved you, you better listen to me. I never heard that. If you talk to a human, that's what they'd say. You owe them if they do something for you, but not God. He gave his life with no strings, and anybody who can accept it can be saved. And if they don't, they won't be. But he didn't consider all the people that wouldn't be. He considered all the people who would. Remember that. He died for ungodly, for the unjust, and made the opportunity available to every single man without prejudice of anything. He completely made eternal life available to everybody that's ever been born with no strings and he gave us a choice
You know, uh, to me, this is my version too. It's a gift. It's a display of God's goodness and not ours. And this is what I personally believe. I'm not going to, I'm going to differentiate, you know, because I haven't quite found a scripture, but the book is full of scriptures that back it, I guess. It's another attempt of God uh, to change us, to be like him. Mercy means I'm going to give you another chance to work it out. I'm going to give you another chance at life. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I don't think it's to be abused. Uh, Romans 2, 4, if you would. And despise, this is where people who judge people, if you despise the riches of his goodness and the forbearance of the long suffering, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance, God will give people a whole lot of things they don't deserve, hoping that they'll turn around. Matthew 18, 30 through 35. It's not to be abused. And he would, this is just about the, the guy who was forgiven the debt. Okay, I, might, I don't have to read it, but I, I will. This guy was forgiven, you know, it was a time to reconcile. And the guy owed the guy so much money, and he pleaded for mercy, and the guy forgave his debt. I know you guys know this, this scripture. And when he gave his, forgave his debt, he, was very, he acted very grateful. But you know what he did, don't you? Somebody else owed him money. And he went out and had the guy put in prison after he was forgiven and could have, they could have sold his kids and his wife into slavery. And he was forgiven. He went out and held another guy accountable for the same thing. It was even less money. Well, guess what the boss heard about it? <laughs> he put him in jail. He says, I forgave you and you won't give, forgive somebody else. Isn't it funny how when you won't forgive, you're the one that goes to jail? That ought to just settle in right there. When you won't forgive, you're the one that's in jail, not them. You're wanting them to be miserable, but the only person that is miserable is you. Because you live in a spiritual jail and it affects your prayer life and God doesn't hear sinners, so he don't hear you. Because you're holding somebody else guilty for something that you have been forgiven for. Freely you have received, freely give. God's given this nation a lot and he's given us a lot. And I promise you that everyone in this room has a whole lot more of whatever it is than the places I've been in the world. And we whine, complain, protest, picket, argue, crazy. It, you gotta make sure you work on your appreciation of your life.